So today, like I said, I just wanted to give that warning that it is parental guidance. There are some more adult type themes there. And also I wanted to give a trigger warning. I don't know if you're aware of trigger warnings. We start seeing them more and more because psychologists are telling us that if you've been subject to severe trauma or abuse, uh, a word or two or a sentence or a picture, an image that you, you create with your words can actually take that person back to that uh, scene where they're actually experiencing it again. And so uh, I'll probably start doing that a little bit if I start mentioning abuse or going into more detail, not that I'm going to go into gratuitous detail or anything like that. But yeah, now I've called this sermon, Oh God, Bring Back the Wonder Women. Now, obviously, it's a tie-in to that awesome film, Wonder Woman. I need to say, however, all films are a bit like fish. You've probably heard me say this before. You like to eat a bit of trout, perhaps, or salmon, but you have to spit out the bones, don't you? You don't eat the bones. And there are certainly bones in Wonder Woman. Uh, the kind of allusions, or not even allusions, just the direct references to the Greek gods and so forth. But there are also some awesome scenes, some amazing scenes. And there's a good book out there which is called something along the lines of Movies as Prayers. And oftentimes when you watch a movie, you're actually seeing a yearning for something. So you might be, or you might be seeing a lament for something. So the movie creates a story, it creates a scene or a bunch of scenes. And in those scenes you see, uh, like I said, lament. You see kind of sadness that this is happening. And many times you might see hope. You might see uh, this desire for it to be better. It's a, essentially a prayer. Now, often I'm not saying that movie directors are praying to God necessarily, but there's that element of yearning. Okay, And I actually kind of like that scene. So if I allude to Wonder Woman, I'm not saying that you should base all your theology upon Patty Jenkins and her awesome movie Wonder Woman, although there are certainly places where I think it enhances our theology. Okay, so that's out of the way. Don't hate me because I'm using a movie. Uh, secondly, I would like all the women to stand up from the youngest to the oldest. I think we won't embarrass anyone by pointing out who the oldest is. I'm not sure who the youngest is. But today, the irony doesn't escape me that I'm a man talking about women. Okay. So, oftentimes I'm going to be directing my words at men. And before I even start, I actually want to pray about that. But I want to pray for you because you are wonder women. I'm going to prove that to you from the scriptures. You are wonder women. All right, let's pray. Father, I just want to pray for each woman here, a sister, a precious sister in Christ. And even if they're not, we pray, bring them into that family of God. Uh, I pray, Father, for each woman here, truly a warrior, brave, courageous, diligent, determined, persevering in Christ, gracious, loving, nurturing, Wonderful in Christ, in Amago Day, in, in the image of God. I just pray they know that today. And for us as men, that we wouldn't be the lesser because of this sermon, but Lord, we would have a God glorifying, Jesus uplifting image in our minds and a feeling in our heart about who you see women as being. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, you can sit down. So the title is a title but it's also a prayer oh god bring back the wonder women so this is a sermon inspired by uh, the first wonder woman eve the mother of all the living she tends to cop a pretty bad rap all through church history tertullian or tertullian had some pretty mean words to say about her uh, all through church history we've got a checkered kind of past in terms of how we've understood eve and understood women in general whenever we go to origin stories in any society, we're going to an origin story, not just to find out where we came from, but to find out who we are. You know that movie Lion? Uh, the guy tries to find his Indian heritage. He goes back to India. And the whole point is that he's trying to establish who he is. He goes back to his origins to see who, see who he is. There's an element of our origin story that we play out every day. So when we come to the mega season, uh, season mega, mega series, Meet God Almighty, session three, and we're looking at Eve, there's an element of, we want to know what it means to be a woman. And in a sense, for us men, we want to know what it means to be a man. When they meet God, when they are in the presence of God, when they're created by God, in all of their perfection back in the garden, we want to know a bit about what that means for us in 2018. 
So that's why it's a sermon inspired by the first Wonder Woman. I may go over 30 minutes. I promised I wouldn't go over 30 minutes and I may go over 30 minutes. So just put your hand up if you want me to stop at the 30 minute mark. And I'll just keep going anyway. No, no, I may stop. You never know. Another point with this is these issues of gender are highly contentious, not just within uh, the world, but within the church. And so I'm not asking you to, or as soon as I say something that appears to be controversial or you don't agree with, I'm just asking you to bear with me. I don't want you to start flicking through the Bible. I'm not going to deal with issues of headship today. I'll do that at another time. I just want to deal with Amargo Day, the image of God. In the image of God, he created them. That's what I want to deal with today. And I just want us to soak in that. So please, would you just bear with me? I've gone to a lot of work to put this together. And if you're on your phones, flicking through to other passages, you're not really listening, you're not going to get what I'm saying. And then you're going to criticize me later for things that I never said because you're just not hearing me. So if you could bear with me, I'd really appreciate that. Sorry, did that come across really harsh? (laughs) Sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, man, I've been preaching for a lot. I don't know how long and I... I just know how it works. It's like, no, I never said that. Um, Anyway, just to say there will be some controversy here and I just ask you to do one simple thing for me. Don't see me as the enemy. See me as your brother who's just trying to struggle through some of these concepts. This is 25 years in the making, probably started ever since I met Kerry uh, and has moved on through there. So yeah, just bear with me. And as I always say, go into the Bible yourself. Just go into it yourself. Don't go Googling someone that you kind of agrees with you and you know is going to agree with you. Just go into the Bible yourself. Sit quietly with God. Jeremiah, uh, what is it, 3.33? No, no, not quite right. But ask of me and I'll show you great and wonderful things in my word that you have not seen. Why don't you just do that one day? Just open up. Lord, I'm asking you for great and wonderful insights. Not just so I can contradict Adrian or whatever, but so that I can be the person you want me to be. I just want to thank Tim for leading us through that. It's so awesome to be forgiven, to be forgiven, to to stand in the presence of God and be forgiven and be accepted and be who we were meant to be. What an awesome thing. Anyway, that was a longer intro. Uh, That's a quote. I'm going to start with a quote. I'm the father of four daughters. I'm not the father of four daughters. I'm the father of three daughters. And they preach to me every day, as does my wife in the way they carry themselves. They are truly wonder women. I'll talk more about that. This is actually a a well-known movie producer, and this is what he has to say. I am the father of four daughters, and you know that I'm a tough guy with taste. Good friends describe me saying I am the tough guy, period. But you know, and I'll tell you, that I'm a complete wuss when it comes to my own kids. And I wanted to do something inspirational for my children. I can guarantee you've seen this gentleman's movies. I can guarantee you've seen probably several of them. He's been making movies for the last 20 to 30 years. And there he talks about his precious daughters, as any father can relate to. Now, I'm sure you have heard of Harvey Weinstein, and I'm not here to speak disparagingly about him. I'm just talking about facts as we know them. Uh, But to me, when I see a quote like that, and then I see this, which is 84 actresses over 20 years uh, accusing Harvey Weinstein of sexual harassment or assault, accusing him of deliberately using his power as a movie producer to get them on the couch, as it was called, and to get them to basically give him sexual favours so that he could then give them the roles. I'm very disturbed by that. I'm very shocked by that. But at the same time, I'm kind of mixed up a bit because then I see the way Hollywood portrays women. And indeed, Harvey Weinstein often tried to show strong women in his roles, women who were overcoming certain obstacles like Lolita and and films like that. Um, And then I see this and they're just the sexual abuse. There's about 20 specific rape charges as well over 25 years or so. And of course, that's just opened up the gates, hasn't it? But the real issue, and we feel for those people, and we feel for Harvey Weinstein's daughters, right? But here's the real issue. The real issue is, and this is well documented now, it's the industry that allowed that. It turned a blind eye. It acted as though nothing was happening. uh, And that over and over, 
So, so what, what then happened was over and over, every woman that that happened to, it was then going to happen to someone else. And it kept going on and on and on because whenever people complained or said something, it was, no, 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 that's Harvey Weinstein. Don't mess with Harvey Weinstein or words to that effect. And so these women objectified for their sexuality, their looks, their physicality, one after another is abused. Now, you th- 84, 84 people. And there's probably many more that have not yet come forward. Why didn't they come forward? Why didn't they come forward? Well, we're told they actually tried numerous times, but they were shut down because of the power gradient that's there. They were shut down. That to me is the real issue. Here's another quote. It says, how much is a little girl worth? How much is a young woman worth? Have you ever thought about that? You know, we think about the sex, sex trade around the world now with young women, but we think about Hollywood as well. What are they worth? Is it the red carpet picture looking glamorous? Is that, is that their worth? I don't know. So this is a lady called uh, Rachel Den Hollander. She's truly a wonder woman. She's the one that asked this. For 16 years, um, in fact, I'll just back up a bit. So Rachel Den Hollander, she's a lawyer now. She's married to a reformed pastor and a reformed uh, church. And she was the first person to come out with sexual abuse allegations against a person called Larry Nassar, who was the USA gymnastics team doctor for about 20, 25 years. Uh, For 16 years, he sexually abused her and literally hundreds of other people. He was so cunning. He would even bring their mothers in because they were young girls doing gymnastics. And he would deliberately position himself while he, under the guise of medical procedures, proceeded to abuse these daughters and get aroused. So I'm not, I don't mean to offend you, but that was the reality. Okay, and he did it. They reckon not only hundreds, but thousands, thousands. Um, That quote about how much is a young woman worth, we're gonna come back to that later, but uh, she said that in her victim statement or her survivor statement, as they're calling it now. Now, the real issue, though, again, is the university, where Larry Nasser came from, the athletics committee leaders that turned a blind eye. As Rachel says, you play word games. She was directing this to Larry Nasser in courtroom. You didn't know because no one believed. And the reason, and, and to other people that were like leaders at the time, and the reason everyone heard about Larry's abuse and did not believe it is because you did not listen. You did not listen in 1997, 1998, 1999, 2000, 2004, or 2014 when these abuse allegations came up. No one knew according to your definition of no because no one handled the reports of abuse properly. So these big committees, these big organisations basically go down a lockdown mode, get the lawyers in and try to basically water down whatever allegations there are, even though there is an overwhelming avalanche of them. And again, culturally, hey, this guy, he's well known, USA Gymnastics, sports. It's going to affect the sport if all this comes out. So the big, dirty secret gets bigger and dirtier and more and more people are hurt by it. And as a father of three daughters, I'm like, man, what is going on with us? Where we say, okay, what's a young woman worth? And we say, obviously, gymnastics is worth more. Obviously, the Hollywood red carpet is worth more. We, we, we are all included now. Whenever, whenever we've gone to one of those movies and paid money, whenever we watch the Olympics, paid money, we are all part of that now. All of us. Not to the same degree as these guys, of course. She said something even more shocking, though, because of my context as a church pastor or a pastoring pilot or whatever. She said this, my advocacy for sexual assault victims cost cost me my church. So she's not talking about Larry Nassar now. She's talking about previous experiences where in large denominational churches, and I'm not going to say them, but you can look them up later and you'll know them straight away. We've sung some of their songs. Uh, they were, there were cover-ups. So she's gone into bat. She's gone in to defend and to be a Wonder Woman, to be a warrior for these sexual abuse victims. When you hear her, you'll quickly see that she's not, uh, and I'm not, I don't believe this, but this is how some people see it, an emotional female that doesn't know what she's talking about. She's very methodolo- uh, methodological. 
She's got that lawyer brain. She's very passionate and she gathers her facts before she speaks. I encourage you, because if you think that it's just in Catholic churches that this is happening, abuse, Look at the Royal Commission, you'll see it was the Church of England. You'll see it was the Salvation Army where terrible atrocities were done. You will see it is the Army, the Navy. You'll see it's even like guru Hindu kind of camps around the place. It's everywhere. Now, wouldn't it have been great if in the church we had said, that is wrong, there needs to be justice, and there needs to be grace. We are not going to hide this. Instead, we handled it just the same as every other one. Terrible. So she goes into, into bat, uh, and this is what she says. The reason I lost my church was not specifically because I spoke up. It was because we were advocating for other victims of sexual assault within the evangelical community. Crimes which had been perpetrated by people in the church and whose abuse had been enabled very clearly by prominent leaders in the evangelical community. If I said their names, you'll know them straight away. This is not a message that evangelical leaders want to hear because it would cost to speak about the community. It would cost to take a stand against these prominent leaders, despite the fact that the situation we're dealing with is, a widely, rec- is widely recognised as one of the worst, if not the worst, instances of evangelical cover-up of sexual abuse. I'll post a link on Facebook later on to her full victim statement, and if you want to go and research it further, you come to your own conclusions, but again, I'm not going to name names here or name churches, but you would know them. So that, to me, is the real issue. Again, is that this abuse that's been enabled by prominent leaders, it just, it was never stopped. Because the church itself was so massive, it, the movement was so massive. Again, the value of a young woman, nah. Our reputation as a mega church, I'm not saying just mega church, it happens in all churches. More important, more important than the, young, the value of a young woman. I put this up here and I use this as an indicative quote. This is not by a person who is a abuser. He's a well-known pastor. Um, he's well-known, again, by other pastors. If I said their names, you'd know them straight away. And again, you can look this up yourself later. But this is a quote that he has as he was directing um, young men and young women in marriage. And he's quite a fiery guy. He's a bit of a probably what you'd call a pulpit shock job. Okay, so he likes to say things to get your attention. And what he says is, um, when we quarrel with the way the world is, we find that the world has a way of getting back at us. In other words, however we try, the sexual act cannot be made into an egalitarian pleasure, pleasuring party. A man penetrates, conquers, colonizes, plants. A woman receives, surrenders, accepts. Now, gives a little thing here saying if you want to learn more about marriage visit I won't be visiting that site I actually give that quote a big R for rubbish so and I'll tell you why in a minute obviously I'm a little bit charged up about it Um, the thing about that is just imagine you're a rape victim in a church and you hear that just imagine you're a young woman trying to work out your way in the world and you hear that from this well-known pastor who's endorsed by people that you know and have listened to And we wonder in the church why uh, we have an issue with our attitudes towards women. Maybe it's because of teaching like that. The real issue there for me is, again, (laughs) this kind of gender stereotyping. It's like, yeah, the woman is the passive receptacle, the nurturer. The man is the phallic giver. You know, he's the he's the. Now, let's just put that little quote up there and let's read something from the Bible and let's just poke some of these misconceptions with the sword of the Spirit. And let's see what happens. See if we can, I don't know, do some myth busting perhaps. So we're told in Genesis 1, 27, that God created man. Now, man is generic there for Adam, the Adam. It literally means the earthling. Man created the earthling in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. And then it, it switches and it says, male and female, he created them. Just, just let, let our f- thoughts focus on them for a moment. It really sunk into my psyche and it kind of, it challenged me actually. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. 
and every other living creature that moves on the ground. So let's just ask some questions. It's always really good to use what I call the interrogative method. Question the text. Bring questions um, that you have to the text and let them open up the text for you. So let me ask this question and I'll ask and I'll put it out there. Who is it that primarily bears the image of God? Thank you, Nadine. A wonder woman just answered. I'm so glad you said that. It was a trick question. Um, and I was going to ask, who is it that secondarily bears the image of God? Neither. They bear the image together. Now, I know all pastors will stand up here and say, women are created equal. Women are no, of no lesser importance than men. Most mainstream pastors are not talking about whack jobs. So, but then the way they act and the way they talk, I knew, I knew a pastor once, we were in the middle of conflict and a lady was crying up the back. And I was just, I was just feeling, I was like, I, wish, I, I, I should cry too. This is terrible. Church conflict, terrible. Jesus cried, by the way. He weeped. And the man who I actually respect said to me, ah, women, they just don't get it. He said it in front of Gabby while Gabby was standing there. I was like, and later on we had a conversation about that. You know, we say we're created equal and then we say dumb things like that as men. They're so emotional, these women. You can't trust what they're saying. We're the strong ones. But wait, male and female, he created them. Neither alone bear the image. Together, they bear, they bear the Imago Dei. Together. Now think about that. If you only had men in the world, you would not see the image of God. If you only had women in the world, you would not see the image of God in this world. Likewise, if you have a man conquering, dominating, even if it's passively, a woman, you do not have a Margot Day. You have a sick, twisted version of it. Who is it that primarily, primarily is fruitful in the increase of humanity on earth? Now, t- typically, all society, not all, but many societies have seen fruitfulness as what? Feminine. You see some of those old Astra images, big breasts, to show the fertility, to show the fruitfulness, right? Surely that's a feminine Uh, connotation oh wait who is it that primarily is fruitful in the increase of humanity on earth god blessed them and said to them be fruitful be fruitful and increase and multiply on earth together they are to be fruitful together they are to multiply together and with everything that that entails the nurturing of a baby the looking after of a baby the tender care of a baby, the giving of love to a baby, blessed are them because God said they're blessed. God said to them, be that. Male as well. This is why I have issues when people say, we need to encourage men in the church. Let's go shooting some guns or let's go to archery range or let's go and drink some home-brewed beer. Like I love doing those things. And again, the irony doesn't escape me that I'm ex-military, rescue pilot, Uh, Big bicep, I rode 20 kilometres this morning, blah, blah, blah. Now I'm sounding like, hey, look at me, look at me. And maybe I am, maybe, I apologise. Just forget that bit. But you know what I'm saying? I could easily say, right, everyone be like me. And then there'll be people, men, that are actually really creative, really good at singing, and I love songs, I love music. Um, And then just don't have biceps as big as me. But I'm, no, 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 if you want to be a Christian man, you need to come to the gun range, son. Like, no. 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 Who is it that primarily rules over creation as the image bearer? Them. God blessed them and said to them in Genesis 1.28, rule. He said to them. He blessed them. Rule. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Atheists and Christians alike agree that men... Humanity, Adam, the earthlings are pretty powerful on earth, aren't they? They rule with their intellect, their wisdom, they rule. God-given mandate, but it is them together. God said to them, rule. And so we come back to this quote, a man penetrates, conquers, colonizes, plants. I'm sorry if this makes you uncomfortable, but this is out there. And this is the reality. That's why I said it's a PG. A woman receives, surrenders, accepts. What? You're a pastor and you're saying this? Now, pastors sometimes say dumb things in the heat of the moment and sometimes they write dumb things. And I hope that 
you know, if he was to listen to this sermon, I don't know why he would, from a little church in Toowoomba, but if he did, I would like to say, could you, you've got, you've got daughters yourself, I've got daughters, like, can we just have a chat about this? Because, <laughs> you know, can we just have a chat? Because I'd really like to understand why he felt he had to say it and why when he was called out on it, he has not recanted as far as we know. He has not, like, tried to... I don't know, you know, maybe put it differently or something. Not, not as far as I know. Anyway, I could be mistaken. Maybe he has in the last few years. I don't know. So what we really have here is these called categories. So we say something like, you know, I've got them up there on the board. A woman, as this pastor has said, she receives, surrenders, accepts. That kind of means she's gentle. She's pretty. She's the homemaker. She's sensitive. She's a princess. She's the weaker sex. She's vulnerable. She's the sidekick. Men, conquer, colonise, plant, strong, brawny, worker, explorer, tough, ruler, you know, the stronger sex, the warrior, the hero. Now, I know you wouldn't sit there and think through all those things, but these are latent in our minds. And I have three massive problems that I just want to go through with that, with that kind of thinking. And believe me, I believe in gender. I believe that God made us male. I believe that God made us female. And together we're the Imago Dei. I believe that fundamentally. I'm just against cultural artifacts that try to tell you you're something when you're not. So the first problem is exegetical, though. And like I've already said, we are told that God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. God blessed them and said to them to rule. They both together rule, which brings us to the helpmate idea. Again, I don't want to deal with headship today from the New Testament. I'll deal with that another day. But I do want to deal with this helpmate idea. Because surely women were made as helpmates for men. And so therefore, the helpmate connotation is subordinate, weaker, less important, perhaps. Isn't that her identity? Helping a man be all that he can be. Now, part of the problem here is a 400 year old version of the Bible called the King James Version, where it says it is not good in Genesis 2.18. This is God speaking. It's not good for man the Adam, the earthling, to be alone, I will make an help, a help meet for him, a help meet. Now, when you hear that, what do you, what do you automatically connote? Help mate. And yet, that's not what it's saying. Actually, the translators were trying to do the best they could with the English that they had at the time. So a help and a meet, that was just sort of complementary to him, to fitting for him, some versions of the Bible will say. The trouble is, over hundreds of years, that became bastardized into help mate. And we know that in the last 400 years of the church, again, they have a really checkered past with how women have been treated. Now, here's what the Holman Christian Standard Bible says. And I think ESV says the same thing, NIV. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. Now, the trouble that we have, though, with that word helper, apart from some of the connotations now that the church is attached to it, is that in the Hebrew, it's actually a really rich term. And it doesn't actually just mean helper in the sense that we understand it in English. And it certainly doesn't mean subordinate. So the way you can work this out is, and you've got to be careful because um, you still, context still drives meaning, okay? But if you look up the word helper in the original Hebrew, you'll find 22 other references. And do you know who they exclusively refer to, almost exclusively refer to? God. Yeah, God. Yeah, you're right, Nadine. For example, Psalm 33, 20. We wait for Yahweh. He is our helper and shield. Psalm 70. I am afflicted and needy. Hurry to me, God. You are my helper, my deliverer. Is God subordinate to you? So this word doesn't carry intonations of subordination or of lesser importance. It does carry... Um, connotations of intense, loving, intimate sort of uh, understanding of your need and bringing help to you. And obviously, if you're the one being helped, say I'm drowning, the helicopter helps me, who's more important in that moment? The helicopter, (laughs) you know? So importance is already contextual in many ways. Not only that, we actually have pictures of helpers, women, throughout the Bible, and they are essential to the Bible's narrative. So let me say two names to you that if 
they didn't exist, you would not, well, you, you would not be here as Christians. Now, I'm not saying God can't do things in other ways and use other people. So their names are Shipra and Pua. I'm not even saying them, right? Does anyone know who they are? They are the midwives that delivered Moses. They helped Moses. If they had not defied the king, if they had not been wonder women, if they had not, with great bravery and courage, at risk to their own lives, and a little bit of humour as well, like, oh yeah, these are Israelite women, they, they, they give birth really quickly, like, we, we get there and the baby's already gone, like, <laughs> you know, like, if they had not helped Moses, Moses would not be here and we would not have the Exodus and we would not have the deliverance of Israel, we would not have the Messiah. I know that God can do it otherwise, but just bear with me in that context for a moment. Then what about Jochebed? Have you heard of Jochebed? Anyone know who she is? I didn't. Well, I, I did vaguely. But shame on me. Like, these are women that were essential. Moses' mother. Moses' mother. Like, how brave was it for her to have that call of God and to put the baby, give up the baby, and obviously I'm pretty sure she's told Miriam, you know, go and see what happens. Puts the baby Moses in because she's worried that he's going to be killed. Maybe the soldiers are right at the door. We don't know the full context. And again, brave, defiant, courageous, a brawny, gritty courage in that moment. And then Miriam running along the bank, you know, seeing the Egyptian princess, who is probably the daughter or closely related to the Egyptian king who wants that baby killed and running up. Brave, courageous, a wonder woman, a princess of Egypt before the prince of Egypt helps Moses, adopts him. Her too. So they're all helpers. I love what this theologian says, a female theologian. She says, the most important in the he- story in the Hebrew Bible, the Exodus, begins with women determining events. It begins with God using the weak and lowly to overcome the strong. It begins with w- women who act courageously, defying oppression. It begins with women who are life-affirming, women who are wise and resourceful in tough situations. Without these wonder women, no Moses. And so some more... Recent scholarship is trying to tackle the connotations of helper. It's trying to tackle the tensions in the text with, you know, the New Testament as well with headship. But some scholars have proposed this, and you can look it up yourself and think about it yourself. But for Genesis 2.18, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a companion as his complement. The second problem I have is that uh, of the experience, oh, sorry, the, the pra- sorry, the practical problem. So the first one was the exegetical, the second one's the practical, and the third one is the experiential. The practical problem is this, if you are being told to multiply, so remember in the first or last session with Adam, we saw that the garden had been built by um, God and placed in there, and it was suited to humanity, but outside was a wilderness. They could go and kind of visit it, but if they had stayed out there, they would soon have maybe, I don't know if you can perish when you're perfect, but you know, it would have been hard, it would have been tough. And so if you're going to go into a wilderness and turn it into a well-kept, ecologically balanced, thoughtful, subdued home, it's going to take both of you as man and woman to be pretty brave. You know, I say this with Kerry when we build a house, like in terms of strength, she needs to be strong. Oh, hooray. Um, maybe I'm going to, that's actually 30 minutes. <laughs> Probably offended too many people. Have you got, it'll be that one down there, Rick. Just go through this door, mate. 